Hello, my name is Jared Skeens and welcome to the Zoom Room. Today we want to look at AS level math, uh, statistics, probability and statistics paper from the May-June 2020 series, which happens to be uh, our new syllabus uh, series cycle as well. And paper uh, 52, remember in the old syllabus, the statistics was paper 62, but now in the new syllabus cycle, it's paper 52 because the mechanics two was taken out. So mechanics one is paper four, and now statistics is paper five. So this is paper 52, and we want to go over the work solutions. And again, as we get to these questions, try to bring to your mind, try to create a, a mental uh, mind map for you where you identify the type of question and try to learn how to think through the problem. So right here in question number one says, for n values of the variable x, it is given that uh, the summation of x minus 50 equals 144 and the summation of x equals 944. Well, you need to recognize that this comes from uh, what some people will call data uh, representation, location, and spread. Others might call it uh, <clears throat> central tendency. And you need to recognize this form right here as being a coded form. Comes from this alternate formula down here. I went ahead and put it in in red so that you can see it. It's not in your formula sheet. It's a formula that you have to memorize. It's the alternate formula for calculating the mean. So make sure you know that formula. Cambridge likes to use these type of questions. So when you see the sum of x minus c, what it means is all the values of a set represented uh, each value being x, have, have been reduced by 50. So your original number set has now become a smaller number set because every value has been reduced by 50. And those were then added up. And if you divide by n, you get what, what I call the small average. And when you add the c back, then you get to the original average. So what we have here is we have that part of the formula, the 144. So we put it over n and we add the 50 back and that gets us to the original mean, the mean of the original number set. So this right over here on the left, the 144 over n is your mean of the small number set that is the coded values we add the 50 back and that gets us to the mean of the original number set. Now over here, we have the sum of X is 944. This is the sum of the original number set. So we have 944 and then divided by however many there are in, that is also your mean. This is the mean of the original number set. This is also the mean of the original number set, but calculated through this alternate formula. So these two then are equal to each other. So 144 plus, or 144 over N plus 50 equals 944 over N. Notice we have fractions. So we're gonna multiply everything by N to get rid of that uh, denominator there. And we end up with 144 plus 50 N equals 944. From here, it's just simple math, solve for N. N is 16. That means there were 16 items in the original number set. Moving on to number two, a total of 500 students were asked which one of four colleges they attended and whether they preferred soccer or hockey. The number of students in each category are shown in the following table. And so this now is probability. This is the probability unit. And find the probability that a randomly chosen student is at Canton College and prefers hockey. So this and means both have to be true. You can represent it with this probability of C and H. And so 
we look at Canton, which is right here, we look at Hockey, which is right here, we see that there are 56 that are both Canton and Hockey. So 56, and here's the total number of students right here, 500. So 56 out of 500, you don't have to reduce it. It's okay to leave it uh, in its unreduced form. Letter B, find the probability that a randomly chosen student is at DeVar College given that he prefers soccer. So this is conditional probability. So your conditional probability would follow this formula. The probability uh, that the student is at DeVar College given that they prefer soccer. So the formula for that is the probability of DeVar and uh, soccer divided by the probability of just soccer. So when we look at DeVar and soccer, we see that it's 120 out of the 500. And then the probability of soccer is down here at the bottom, 280 out of the 500. Uh, you have an improper fraction, you invert and multiply the 500s cancel, and you end up with 120 over 280. Part C, one of the students is chosen at random, determine whether the events, the student prefers hockey, and the event, the student is at Amos College or Ben College, are independent, justify your answer. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna identify the probability of each of these separately. So the probability that they prefer hockey, we come back up here, we see the total hockey is 220. So that's 220 out of the 500. The probability that they're at either Amos or Ben College. So here's Amos and Ben, 86 and 156. That's what, uh, 242. So you have 242 out of the 500. Then we wanna find the probability of both together, that they're Amos or Ben and hockey together. So here's Amos and Ben. So that's 104 uh, because it's Amos, Ben and hockey. Okay, so Amos, Ben and hockey and uh, 104 out of the uh, 500 uh, students. Then what we want to do is we want to multiply the probability of hockey uh, times the probability of uh, Amos or Ben. And when we multiply those together, we get uh, 1,331 out of 6,250 and Notice that those two, uh, when we compare this one here with this one up here, they are not equal. If they were equal, then they would be independent. Since these are not equal, therefore they are not independent. So going on here to this one, uh, don't actually see the number. I think the number uh, got off the page there. <laughs> Two machines, A and B, produce metal rods of a certain type. The lengths in meters of 19 rods produced by A and 19 rods produced by B are shown in the back-to-back -back stem and leaf diagram. Here's the key, which tells us how to uh, interpret the, um, the, this diagram. So 7224 means 0.227. So there's a decimal in front of the stem uh, and, it, and it shows it for both A and B. So part A here, find the median and the interquartile range for machine A. So here's machine A, we have 19 values. So if 19 values, if you have nine and nine, that's 18. So the middle one is 10, 10 is an exact middle. So if 10 is the exact middle, we count going out from the stem. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. This one right here is the 10. So it's 0.238. Don't forget to put the decimal in front of the two. So the median or the middle is 0.238. We also wanna find the interquartile range. 
So if the eight right here is the middle, we have nine values on both sides. Nine has an exact uh, middle. Uh, so you can see four and four is eight. The exact middle is the fifth one. So again, we count to the fifth one, one, two, three, four, five. So this one right here, the one. And if we count five on the other side, one, two, three, four, five, it's this one here. So 0.231 and 0.245. 0.231 is quartile one, 0.245 is quartile three. You subtract quartile three minus quartile one and you get 0.014 is the interquartile range. Moving on, it is given that for machine B, the median is 0.232, the lower quartile is 0.224, the upper quartile is 0.243. You could go back and check those over here, but they give it to you so you don't have to do all that work again. Uh, you can see also the minimum is 0.211 and the maximum is 0.256. And you need those five number summary. You need the minimum, the quartile one, the median, the quartile three, and the max in order to do the box and whisker plot. So draw box and whisker plots for both A and B. And so you can go back and look at the minimum, quartile one, median, uh, the quartile three, and the maximum. And also for B, they gave us that information right here. All we had to look up was the minimum and maximum. Plot those together, uh, your box and whisker plot on the same diagram. Notice I put the scale at the bottom. It's important for box and whisker plots that you have a scale. So uh, I, looked here, so 0 0.20, 0 0.21, 0 0.22, 0 0.23, 0 0.24, 0 0.25, and 0 0.26. So the scale is here, and these are all put in based on the five number summary. Hence, make two comparisons between the lengths of rods produced by machine A and those produced by machine B. So the two observations that I made is that machine B has a greater speed spread of values. B has a greater spread from A, or you could say that A uh, has less of a spread than B. The second thing I noticed is that the mean of A is greater from the mean of B. Here's the mean or average length of rod for A, and right here is the average length of rod of B. And so the average uh, rod, the length of rod for A is a little bit longer than the average for B, or you could say that B is shorter from A. Going on, <clears throat> uh, number four here, trees in the Redian forest are classified as tall, medium, or short, according to their height. The heights can be modeled by a normal distribution with a mean of 40 meters and a standard deviation of 12 meters. Trees with a height of less than 25 meters are classified as short. So that's here we're dealing now with a uh, standard or a, sorry, a normal distribution uh, unit that we uh, discussed. So find the probability that a randomly chosen tree is classified as short. Okay, so our random variable is that we're being classified as short varies by normal distribution. So in normal distribution, your parameters are uh, the mean, which is 40, and the variance. The variance is standard deviation squared. So since it gave a standard deviation, we'll put the little square up here. So your parameters are mean and variance. And we're looking for the probability that our random variable here is less than 25 meters, because less than 25 meters is the value that then classifies as short. So we want to find out what that probability actually is. So we plug this into our standardization formula, which you learned when you studied normal distribution, your little z formula. Z equals the 25 minus the mean divided by standard deviation. This is standard deviation, not the variance. So we just take the 12 only. We don't, don't take the square. 
And when you calculate that, notice you get a negative 1.25. So this is what we need to look up in our phi z chart. It's called the phi z chart. Hopefully you have one of those available for you. Cambridge does provide that for you. You should have it in the formula sheet, or you can probably look up online phi z chart. But the phi z chart is only for positive numbers. So we're going to plug in the 1.25. We're going to hold off on the negative till later. When you look at the phi z chart for 1.25, you should end up with 0.8944. This is the probability that's in the middle of your phi z chart. So the one and the two and the five, the 1.2 is the, the value that you see on the left of the chart. The five is in the numbers at the top of the chart. It does not have the third decimal, so you don't need those columns on the far right. So when you look up this, the cross-reference between 1.2 and the 5 that you see at the top, and you cross those together, you should get a probability of 0.8944. Then because this had a negative on it, we need to do 1 minus the probability, and we get 0 0.1056. So to three significant figures, the probability that a randomly selected tree is classified as short is 0 0.106 or almost 11%. Uh, now of the trees that are classified as tall or medium, one third are tall, two thirds are medium. Show that the probability that a randomly chosen tree is classified as tall is 0.298, correct to three decimal places. Well, first of all, we need to realize that these tall and medium are not short. We just calculated the probability that it's short. So if it's not short, the one minus 0 0.1056, notice we use the unrounded one here, then the 0.8944 would represent our tall and medium. Of this, one third are tall. So we take one third of the 0.8944, and that gives us the 0.2981. So the 0.298 to three significant figures would be our probability that uh, a randomly chosen tree would be tall. So again, you need to realize that the combination of medium and tall are not short. And so that gives you a total probability to work with and, and then you can take the one third of those uh, to get the probability for the tall. Moving forward here, it says, find the height above which trees are classified as tall. So we saw that short trees were 25, less than 25 meters. Now we wanna find what exactly the height would be uh, to reach the uh, category classified as tall. So again, we're still dealing with normal distribution. So our randomly, uh, our random variable here of our chosen tree is going to be distributed normally with the mean of 40. That's 40 meters is the uh, mean height and a variance of 12 squared. So what we're looking for is the probability that our randomly chosen tree is above or equal to a particular value. That value is what we want to look for. And we already found that the probability that they're tall is 0.298. Actually, we could have used the 2.981, but it's uh, OK. And uh, so when we subtract that, we get uh, what we have here is we have a little bit of an issue. We have two issues here. The first issue is that our probability is less than 0.5. You can't look up on the phi z chart probability less than 0.5. And also we have a greater than and your phi z chart is only for less than. So these two problems actually work together. We can solve them both at the same time. To get rid of the greater than, we can just do one minus the probability. That will change it to a less than. I put less than or equal to. Technically, it should probably be just less than, although since we're dealing with continuous data, 
the presence or absence of that equal to doesn't really matter. But since it's not greater than or equal to, it should have been just less than x. And the probability is 0 0.7019. Uh, I believe I did put in the 1, which is why we have the 1, 9 and not 2, 0. Uh, but 0 0.7019 is what we want to look up in our phi z chart. Notice it is now above 0.5, so that original problem we had uh, is resolved by doing the one minus because of the greater than sign. So those are some little details that you need to kind of pay attention to when you're working with the phi z chart. Uh, but now this probability is uh, not a problem. So we look for this probability. Now you're looking in the middle of the phi z chart and you're trying to find the numbers on the left and on the top. So when you look at those numbers, your z value which are the outside numbers of your chart, would be 0.53. So the 0.5 would be on the far left. The three would be on the top. Those two cross together to give you your 0 0.7019. Then you have the rest of your standardized formula, the X, which we don't know, minus the mean over the standard deviation. Again, we don't use the square. This is variance up here. We just want standard deviation. And so this is the formula we now get. Multiply the 12 to the other side, you get 6.36. Add the 40. So the x is 46.36 to three significant figures. It would be 46.4 meters. Any tree that is 46.4 meters or above uh, would now be classified as tall. Moving on to number five, we're back to probability again. A fair three-sided spinner has sides numbered one, two, three. So I, I listed it right here on the left. A, five, five, a fair five-sided spinner has sides numbered one, one, two, two, and three, and I put those across the top. So the fact that they're fair means the probability of spinning any particular number is the same. And so what we want to do is cross-reference the one spinner versus the other spinner. It says both spinners are spun uh, once. For each spinner, the number on the side on which it lands is noted. The random variable is the larger of the two numbers if they are different and their common value if they are the same. So if we look here, if we spin a one and a one, they're the same, so it's just one. One and one is the same, so it's one. One and two, the larger value is two. One and two, larger value is two. And one and three, the larger value is three. So you go through comparing all the spins and you, if the numbers are the same, you take that number. If the numbers are different, you take the larger number. So this is a, what our random variable is comparing here. These values down here show that are show that the probability that your random number is a three is seven out of 15. So if we look at the threes, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of a total of 15 uh, values. So seven over 15. Draw up the probability distribution table for X. Well, so what we want are is the possible values of X over the probability that your random variable takes that particular number. So the possible values that we got were a one, two, or three. So that goes here in the top. That's your possible values for X. Then what we want are the probability of each of those. So we already saw that the threes were seven out of 15. If you look at the twos, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the number of ones are only two. So two out of 15 for the ones, six out of 15 for the twos, and seven out of 15 for the threes. This is our probability distribution table for our random uh, variable X that fit the criteria that was uh, described up here. Moving on to part C, find E of X and var X. So E of X is your expected mean. It's, a, it's an expected mean. So what you would do is we come up here and we multiply each one of these values by its probability and we add them together. So one times 2 15ths plus two times 6 15ths 
plus three times seven fifteenths. And we add those together and we get 35 fifteenths, which reduces to seven thirds, or you could put 2.33 to three significant figures. So that's the expected mean. That's the expected average that you would get. And then the variance, which has a, which is a measure of spread. We take each of the X values, we square them, then we multiply by uh, the probability. We add them all up. We add them all up. So here's each of the three numbers squared first, then multiplied by their particular probability. We add all those up into one sum, and then we subtract the mean squared. So I put the 35 fifteenths, you could have used the 7 thirds. So minus the 35 fifteenths squared or the 7 thirds squared. And you uh, work all this out. You can follow the math here. And you end up with a variance of 22 over 45 or three significant figures as a decimal 0.489. So this again is a measure of spread. Now to number six, find the number of different ways in which the 10 letters of the word summertime can be arranged so that there is an E at the beginning and, uh, and an E at the end. So this is um, uh, permutations and combinations unit. And when, when we covered this in class. You need to kind of uh, pay attention to your strategy here. First, you need to say, is this combination or permutation? Since this is uh, arrangements, this is permutation. Second thing you need to figure out is what are your restrictions? Restrictions are there needs to be an E at the beginning and an E at the end, which happens to take both of the E's in the word. So that uh, so out of 10 letters, there are eight letters left. <coughs> and now we can go ahead and um, start to formulate our calculation here. So for the eight letters that are left, they can be arranged with eight factorial. That's our middle letters, the eight factorial ways of arranging those middle letters. Then we're going to multiply that by two because we have an E at either end and they can be switched. So that's what the times two is. Then on the bottom, we're going to eliminate uh, the identical letters uh, because even though we had an E at both ends and you can switch them, you can't tell the one from the other. So actually it's gonna end up canceling it out. You're switching them because they're identical. You can't distinguish them. So we need a two factorial. That's for the E's that you cannot distinguish. We need another three factorial because there are three M's that we also cannot distinguish one from the other. And those M's got rearranged here in the middle. That's part of the eight factorial. So there's three M's we need to divide by three factorial that will eliminate uh, the, the arrangements that are not distinguishable. And so we end up with a total of 6,720 uh, distinguish, distinguishable patterns of arranging the word summertime. Now letter B, find the number of different ways in which the 10 letters of the word summertime can be arranged so that the E's are not together. This is still a permutation. Remember combinations has to do with selections to a group. This is uh, um, arrangements, which means the sequence matters. And uh, we're still using the word summertime. But in this case, the restriction is that the E's are not together. So our strategy for this is called spaces. We take our word summertime, we take out the E's because that's part of our restriction. And so the other eight letters we arrange here 
the arrange, particular arrangement doesn't matter. Just spell it out, S U uh, M M, skip the E, go to the R, T I M, and skip the last E. And we're gonna put spaces both in front and in between and at the end of all the letters. So there's a space uh, in front and in between and at the end of these letters. So first we're gonna deal with the letters that we have. We have eight letters. So again, that is eight factorial ways of arranging those letters. Now we get to the restriction part. The E's cannot be together. In other words, they have to be separated. That's what these spaces are for. So for the first E, there are nine different spaces that that E could go into. So that would give nine different possibilities there. And then once the E is placed in, uh, now there's only eight different spaces available for the second E. So the first E there's times nine. And for the second E, there's only eight spaces left. So times eight. And then again, on the bottom, we need to eliminate the identicals. So there are two E's and three M's. So two factorial and three factorial. When we multiply all this out, there are 241,920 uh, different arrangements that satisfy this uh, restriction. Then going on down here, four letters are selected from the 10 letters of the word summertime. So right away we see we've switched from probability over to, com or from permutations over to combinations. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to distinguish is it permutations or combinations. Permutations was arrangement, the order matters. Now this is combinations. The order doesn't matter as long as you're selected into the group. So we have four letters selected out of the word summertime. Find the number of different selections if the four letters have to include at least one M and exactly one E. So here's our restrictions that we need to think about first. So exactly one E, let's put that down and at least one M. Notice there's different number of M's. So we need to make what we call cases, a case for what if there's only one M because we have to at least have one, one. What if there are two and what if there are three? Notice we can select all the way up to four letters. And since there are three M's and exactly one E, that fills in the four letters. So here's our three cases. We have to have exactly one E, so that's taken care of. And we have a case for one M, a case for two M's, and a case for three M's. So here's our three different cases. Now, we've already dealt with the E's and the M's. So if we take those out, because we've already set those in place, then there are five letters left, an S, a U, an R, a T, and an I. So remember the E's are eliminated now and the M's are eliminated. Those have already been taken care of based on the restrictions. So there's five letters left. In our first case, we still need two more letters. So we're gonna do five choose two. We're using the uh, symbol on your calculator, the NCR key on your calculator. It's for combinations out of five, you're choosing two. And that comes up to 10. For the second case, there's only one spot left. So five choose one. And then on the last case, there are no spots left. So this all counts as just one, um, one uh, selection or one way of selecting. We add these three together and that gives us three different, or sorry, we add these three together, we get 16 different selections, okay? Moving on to page 12, I don't see exactly what number it is here. On any given day, the probability that Mona, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, Moena messages her friend Pasha is uh, 0.72. Now with uh, distribution, again, you wanna ask yourself, is it discrete or continuous? This is messaging a friend on a particular day. So on a day, you're either gonna get a message or you're not gonna get a message. 
so that's discrete. You don't have half a message. Okay, so it's not continuous, it's discrete. Now we have to decide between binomial distribution and geometric distribution. So binomial has a fixed number of days, geometric does not. So find the probability that for a random sample of 12 days, notice it's a fixed number of trials. So we're looking at only 12 days. Each day, Moena either gets a message or does not get a message from uh, her friend Pasha. So, and it's on no more, the probability that it is no more than nine days. So here is our random variable X that is a distributed binomially because it's discrete and has a fixed number of days. And the parameters for binomial are the number of trials, which are 12, and the probability of success, which is 0.72. So I like to put on the side, even though it's technically not one of the parameters, I like to write down the probability of failure because it's in the formula. So one minus 0.72 is 0.28. So 12 is the number of trials, 0.72 is the probability of success and 0.28 is the probability of failure. And our probability that we're looking for is that our random variable occurs less than or equal to, that is no more than, would be equal to or less than nine days. Well, if we go less than or equal to nine, that would be nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And don't forget the zero. So that would actually be 10 calculations, but we don't want to do 10 calculations. There's an easier way. If it's less than or equal to nine, that means it is not 10, 11, or 12. So you can either do 10 calculations or you can do three calculations. Three is easier. So we're gonna do the not 10, 11, and 12. So the not is represented by the one minus. And then in these brackets, we're gonna calculate our 10, 11, and 12. This formula is in your formula sheet provided by Cambridge. Uh, however, instead of using the NCR key, it uses that Pascal's looks like a column vector uh, but it's, it's Pascal's kind of column vector. Uh, so this is 12. Uh, I use the NCR key on the calculator. 12 uh, total trials, and we're going to have choose 10 because it, we're doing the 10, 11, and 12. So notice the 10, 12, choose 11, 12, two, choose 12. Then the probability of a success is implied to be 10 times. That means there's two probabilities of failure. Over here, there's 11 success, one failure. And over here, there's 12 success and no failures. So you calculate this out using your NCR key, your probability of success raised to the 10th power, your probability of failure raised to the second power. Second power. So here's for uh, the 10 is the 0.19372. For the 11 comes out to 0 0.09057. For the 12 comes out to the 0 0.01941. Add those all together, you get 0 0.3037. And it's not that, so one minus that gives us 0 0.6963 to three significant figures is 0 0.696 is our probability of getting nine or less days where Moena receives a message from her friend. Going on to part B, Moena messages Pasha on January 1st. So now we're talking about Moena messaging Pasha, not Pasha sending a message to Moena. And she did so on the 1st of January. Find the probability that the next day on which she messages Pasha is the 5th of January. Now, technically this is your geometric probability because you do not have a specific number of trials. You're just counting until she messages again, meaning you could count indefinitely, but they do tell us that she messages on the 5th of January. So that means that the second and third and fourth were failures and the fifth is our first success that we run into. So this follows your geometric formula. Three failures, 
one success, your failure was 0.28, your success was 0.72. Calculate that together and you get 0 0.0158 is the probability, uh, which, you know, this is almost like a one and a half percent, little over one and a half percent that Moeno will wait all the way to the fifth to message Pasha again. So low probability, more likely she messages before then. Letter C, use an approximation to find the probability that in any period of 100 days, Moena messages Pasha on fewer than 64 days. <clears throat> now, the important thing here to remember is that we're still in discrete data. Message or not message, that's discrete. There's not a half a message. So we're still in binomial uh, or we're back to binomial distribution because we have a fixed number of trials, 100 days. So let's start with that. We have our random variable distributed binomially uh, because it's discrete with a fixed number of days. Our parameters are the fixed number of trials, which is 100. Probability of success is still 0.72. This time I did not put the 0.28 on the side. Sometimes I do because it's the probability of failure. And our probability that we're looking for is uh, that she messages Pasha on less than, fewer than 64 days. Now, because this is discrete, we need to have the equal to in there. Discrete must fall on a particular value. That's a little different from continuous. So, uh, if it's less than 64, then that means it's less than or equal to 63. So we go down to the next integer value. So our probability is X less than or equal to 63. Now, obviously we don't wanna calculate all the values from 63 down to zero, nor do we wanna calculate the not values of 64 all the way up to 100. So those are too many calculations for us to use the binomial formula for. So what we're gonna do is we can check if we can use the normal to approximate the binomial. Now, we already know that we can because it told us to use the approximation, but just in case you have to justify it, all you have to do is do N times P and that should be greater than five. Well, 100 times 0.72 is 72. 72 is obviously greater than five. You also do n times q, q being the probability of failure, which was 0.28. 100 times 0.28 is 28. That is also greater than five. If both of those are greater than five, then you are justified in using the normal to approximate the binomial. So that means we need to convert our parameters over into the normal distribution system. So our random variable is distributed normally and we need to find the mean and the variance. Well, if you look in your formula sheet, the mean is in uh, P is the mean, N times P, that's how you find your expected mean from this kind of data. Again, it's in your formula sheet. So 100 times 0.72 is 72. And the variance is NPQ. It's also in your formula sheet. So 100 times 0.72 times the 0.28 gives you your 20.16. Now we have the parameters for normal distribution. Uh, the next thing we need to do because of using an approximation is we need to change our discrete data into continuous data. In other words, discrete data goes by integer values. So there's gaps in between. We need to fill in the gap. So instead of 63, we need to have a lower and upper bound. So our lower and upper bound is 62.5 and 63.5. That's the bounds between the next uh, integer 62 and the next integer 64. So our 63 is 62.5 or 63.5. Since we wanna go less than 63 and we need to include the entire uh, continuous data, and since it's going less than 63, then we need to use the 63.5 so that we get all of the values that are included with the 63. 
And so we, uh, we add the 0.5, that's called the continuity correction. That's what the CC means, continuity correction. We uh, added 0.5 because we're going in the less than direction. If you were going in the greater than direction, you would subtract 0.5. So 63.5 is our continuity correction. We plug that into our standardization formula, 63.5 minus the mean, which is our 72. And we need to divide by the standard deviation. Well, this up here is the variance. So to get standard deviation, you just do the square root of the variance. So square root of 20.16, calculate this out. We get a negative 1.893. Again, we're gonna hold the negative off for a little bit because you can't look up a negative value in your phi z chart, only has positive values. So we look up the positive 1.893 in the phi z chart. And we find that the 1.8, which is on your left, and the nine, which is on the top, gives you a 0 0.9706. Then we need to look up this little three, which is in the far upper right-hand corner, those columns on the far right. Look at the three at the top and cross-reference it down until you meet with uh, where this 0.9706 uh, cross-references to, and you'll see you need to add an additional two to the end. And so it becomes 0.9708 and this negative means that we need to do one minus that. And so that gives us a 0 0.0292 uh, is our probability that Moena would message uh, Pasha on less than 64 days out of 100. So you can see it's almost about a 3% uh, chance. And that brings us to the end of our paper uh, 52. That's our paper five, zone two, for the May-June uh, 2020 series. Again, remember this is our new syllabus now content for uh, the probability and statistics. The new content in this uh, syllabus series is the geometric probability. Everything else is the same as what it was before. So as always, thank you for joining me in the Zoom room and hope to see you again next time.